Howdy ho ho my good humans. How the hell are you all doing? This is Unnecessary Rambling. I am Brandon Sylvia. I appreciate y'all for tuning in for some PS5 pickups. Got about 13 games that we will be going over here today in the video. So uh, yeah, hope you are all doing well. If you're new and you enjoy the content, consider subscribing, liking, all that good shit. But let's go ahead and get into the games, man. And let's kick it off with game i just finished last night and that is old astrobot put about seven eight ish hours into it really enjoyed it um and i'll you know dive further into the game at the end of the month when we do the uh monthly rankings for all the games we played in the month but yeah overall really enjoyed it on a performance on a technical level one of the just most impressive games i've played all generation and I'm also really happy to see that it is performing well, uh, not only critically, which it is doing crazy numbers critically, but it seems to be doing really damn well commercially as well. And I kind of worried about that, you know, thinking that PlayStation has kind of marketed themselves as the premier place to play games. These like narrative driven, realistic, kind of more adult centric titles. And I'm like, is Astrobot, does it really have any chance on PlayStation, but then the more I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, I think Astrobot has a damn good chance on PlayStation because the characters that you're, you know, the little bots that you're going around and collecting and the worlds that you're visiting, like, it's all very nostalgic to people who have been with PlayStation for 20, 30 years or whatever. So it kind of has that perfect crossover where it is cute and lighthearted and simple and easy to pick up and play and fun where the younger audiences can get into it but then it has the nostalgia factor for you know people like myself and probably the majority of you watching this it's i think it just does a really good job of kind of catering to both markets there so shout out to team asobi shout out to astrobot definitely a uh really solid you know i even say game of the year contender and also i gotta shout out the fact that this is a damn good uh physical edition it comes with some dope ass artwork a cool poster like a little comic strip thing on the back of the poster i feel like we've all kind of collectively gotten to the point where we expect the absolute bare minimum for companies with their physical releases and honestly just at that point of capital c consumerism where we just ex expect and accept the bare minimum in general when it comes to these companies but uh yeah it's always great to see just a tad bit of effort put into these physical editions space marine 2 just picked this up i've only spent about two ish hours with it so far so my first impression with space marine 2 would be so i thought it was going to be more just like a straight up gears of war clone which i wouldn't have minded that at all i think we need more gears of war clones in this world just tight third person linear shooters but this actually, it has more uh, melee mechanics involved in it. Like you have a, a dodge move, a parry move, like straight up pretty solid, competent third person melee action. Um, the, the damn parry is one of the most satisfying mechanics I've, I've seen in a while, especially like there's some satisfying parries out there, but when you time that parry perfectly in Space Marine 2 and you just rip the enemy in half, like it is really, really satisfying, but yeah, I, I can't say that I'm super invested in the story or the world or anything like that. I'm not a Warhammer guy. I watched a Everything You Need to Know video before diving into Space Marine 2, but I'm not like, I really don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm trying my best to keep up. But um, yeah, the, it's been impressive. It's also, it, I got some Days Gone vibes for a second where they sent out these horde of fucking little monsters that were coming at you and you're gunning these bitches down and it's uh, really, really impressive on a technical level so I, i'm sure once again by the end of the month when i do the ranking i'm sure i will have finished the game i don't think it's i wouldn't imagine it's gonna be that long it seems like very linear and kind of straight to the point for at least the story portion of the game so i'm hoping maybe eight ish hours i don't think i would want much more than that so these next three were kind of just impulse purchases i picked up the last of us part two the remaster i want to play through i'd like to play through both of the games before the season two comes out the hbo show i might place i might play part one before season two and then after season two jump in to part two to see how they compare um but yeah i i just wanted to pick it up got it for a decent price and i was like yeah I, i'll replay it at some point i was never crazy about 
I, I, I love The Last of Us Part Two from a mechanical standpoint. I was never really crazy about the story. I, I didn't really care about the the big moment that, that I'm sure most of you, I, I'm dancing around it, trying not to spoil it. I'm sure most of you are fully aware of the big moment in t 2. I didn't really care about that as much. I just thought the pacing was was really off. Like it was, it was pretty poorly paced in my opinion. It felt like it could have ended two or three times before it did. But to be fair, I also played it during the pandemic and I don't know if that's like necessarily the best time to play a game that's that dour and that depressing and it's like holy shit everything around me is really fucking depressing and now i got 20 hours of depression with this damn game thrown on top of it so we'll see how i feel about it in retrospect but yeah and i haven't played it since 2020 either so really curious to see how i feel about it now bomb rush cyberfunk so i played this a while back on uh, I think it came out last year, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if it was Game Pass or maybe I just bought it digitally on the Series X. I enjoyed it for what it was. It was, you know, uh, obviously very Jet Set Radio inspired. And I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. It didn't really connect with me and hook me in the way that like Jet Set Radio Future did. But once again, timing is so important where 2023, we were just loaded it seemed like super, super high quality game release after super high quality game release. Like you really didn't have any breathing room or any time for kind of middle of the road, seven ish out of 10 games. And I definitely think bomb rush cyberpunk would have fit into that seven out of 10 camp. It's a good high quality game. Um, but yeah, I wonder maybe going back to it now, I'll dig it a little bit more. And then we got stranger of paradise, the old, uh, final fantasy. This is the, the team ninja title, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The team ninja game. Um, I, so the only reason I picked it up, as you see here, got it for $19.99 and I, I picked it up because I remember when this released, it was so memeable. Like I remember seeing so many viral clips of the game and I just, I don't know. I, I kind of don't really even know what is real with uh, stranger paradise like i don't know which memes are legit or which memes were fan edited so i just kind of want to go in blind and see how batshit crazy this thing is because there are a fuck ton of clips out there that just make this game look so hilarious and i don't know if it's intentional humor if it's unintentional i think that's even funnier so yeah i just i want to go into it blind and, and see what i get out of it all right and next up we have some sports games here we got college football 2025 i've already talked about it uh quite a bit on the channel so i'll be brief here i enjoyed it i think they have a lot to build on i think there are a lot of modes and just features in in college football 2025 that either either feel hollow or just underbaked to a certain degree and i'm hoping that this will just be the the foundation i think the core gameplay for college football 2025 is really really good the speed feels great you know there's minor tweaks that i feel like could be done i wish the receivers were a little bit more aggressive and there's always going to be shit like that that can be ironed out but i really think that going into 2026 let's get those modes corrected you know let's let's get the simulation uh structure ironed out for the dynasty modes let's get the road to glory get back to where you can you know start from high school and then build yourself up as a five star like let's not jump straight in and pick it for a five star four star three star whatever like that's so i don't know that's so silly in my opinion like who who wants to who wants to do that i just like can't really see most players picking to be a three star or less you know caliber player which you could say okay well in high school most uh most people who are playing through the high school portion of the road to glory end up being four star five star so but i don't know it just feels more earned whenever you go through the little season the little uh, playoffs for the high school career and then you end up being a five sc five star and i don't know it feels more it feel you feel more invested in that entire journey but yeah a lot they can improve on but core foundation for college football 2025 really solid nba 2k25 in both of these games it's just these are games i play with buddies these are games that you know i i'm going to pick up the nba game every year i'm usually madden is the one that i i skip on the most i'll be picking up college football every single year that they release it i'm gonna pick up nba 
every single year that they release it. Usually with NBA, I'll wait on on a little bit of a sale, but this year I had my damn GameStop points, and I think I had like a stupid amount of points, so it knocked like thirty dollars off the game. So, all right, fuck it. I I needed to spend the points before they ran out, so I went ahead and picked up two K twenty five and. I, I saw some stuff online that really piqued my curiosity with, for one, they they changed like the default camera angle to where it's a little bit lower. The lighting looks a little bit better in the arenas. The ball movement feels a little bit slower and more deliberate, but it also feels like you're able to really kind of plan out entire dribble setups to where it's not just like spammy crossover after spammy crossover. You're, you're able to like, I don't know, get yourself into position for... Like if you're, you know, a shot creator, you're trying to set up the shot opposed to just blowing past the enemy with some kind of cheesy animation. So I listen, it's always going to be the thing with 2K where people are going to figure out how to take whatever additions you made to the mechanics and whatever additions you made to the speed of the game, the ball handling, the different, you know, uh, the, the new shot animations, all of this shit, they're going to be able to take it and tinker with it until they find the cheesiest build possible, the cheesiest way to play possible. And that's just, uh, you got to know that that's going to happen. But in terms of, I think for what I want out of 2K, just a game to pop in, play with some buddies in sort of a couch competitive setting to jump into a dynasty mode and be able to go between all your different eras. And if you want to start a franchise with the 03 fucking Pistons and pick Mello instead of Darko Milicic. And like, that's the shit that I really get a lot of, of joy out of. I'm, I have no interest in really getting in the trenches and going through all the, you know, career fucking online grind fest. And next up, we got old Pentiment on the PS5. The, the crazy ass situation with the, you know, Xbox porting their games over to PlayStation. I picked up Pentiment and Hi-Fi Rush. I haven't gotten Hi-Fi Rush yet. I'm assuming that will come in the mail. I, I don't know. I guess that might be a little bit later since Pentiment released before Hi-Fi Rush. But yeah, picked up those two just for the novelty alone. And I mean, for the fact that, you know, I would like to have those games on a non-DRM dependent system. That way I can actually own them and be able to play them for the long term. And Pentiment is one that I actually really want to go back and play because I never finished it on Game Pass. Whereas with Hi-Fi Rush, there, you know, there's an aspect of that where I did play through it. I did finish it. So there's maybe more so me just owning Hi-Fi Rush for the novelty of it. But with Pentiment, I definitely am going to uh, crack that open and play it. And also... Limited run. Come on, man. This thing came... The, the I know PlayStation games, modern games in general, come loose all the time, but it's like, limited run. How the hell... How the hell are we getting this for a limited run release? Also picked up System Shock. I can't really talk much about this yet. I haven't had the chance to really dive into it, but I am looking forward to uh, checking out the OG. What, what, one of the games that really kicked off, and probably the game that really kicked off the immersive sim craze, and then with Deus Ex, and obviously Bioshock and Dishonored and all that shit that would follow it. But yeah, definitely got to check out System Shock. Star Wars Outlaws. So I played this, finished this, put about 30 hours into it. And it's really a weird ordeal with Star Wars Outlaws. It's a really good game, but it takes way too long to become a really good game. It takes about four hours before you got your ship and your speeder bike and I don't really mind a slow burn in games, but I do think you saw a lot of the backlash, a lot of the online creators who don't necessarily have the most patient mindset when going into games, just shitting all over this thing. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that if you take four hours to really get off the ground, and I mean, you can say that literally, uh, it takes about four hours until you get your ship and you have this full galaxy to explore and you're roaming around on that speeder bike and it really starts to become the game it was marketed as i think that's a that, that's a big problem i mean that opening section where it's just like go run around and collect some coins it's like what the fuck are you doing i mean i get it you want to immerse people in the world and see how beautiful this world is that you create in the atmosphere and the lighting and the visuals it's a stunning stunning star wars recreation but you know get, get to the good shit a little bit quicker man but yeah Played 30 hours of it. I really, really dug it. It's definitely up there for me right now for my game of the year running. It's a game. It's a game that's kind of tailor made for someone like me, though. You know what I mean? It's a game that is open world, fucking 
sci-fi, third-person shooting, kind of Uncharted meets Metal Gear meets Grand Theft Auto. It's like all of these blended together that that's, you know, just tailor-made for somebody like me. And I, I think that the game does have flaws. And you also see um, the, I think the lead director talking about on Twitter that they're looking to course correct some of the auto fail stealth missions. And I think outside of the slow start, that was probably the other big complaint where people are like, dude, why are we doing these stealth segments where if we get caught, we go all the way back to the beginning of the level. And it, I'll say that there's so much shit here. There's so much to unpack with star Wars outlaws. I think it's a fascinating situation. Cause you see Ubisoft stock plummeting. Um, I, that's fascinating in and of itself. It seems like Ubisoft might be a prime acquisition target at this point. And then that leads to another fascinating scenario where it's like, damn, if Microsoft acquires Ubisoft, what happens there because of the whole CMA thing where, uh, what was it? Uh, Ubisoft now owns all the rights to the ABK cloud streaming shit. So I don't know. I'm not, I, you know, we're going way down fucking tin foil, tin foil hat, fucking conspiracy road. But it is weird to think about what would happen in that situation if Ubisoft was looking to get bought out and Microsoft acquired them and the whole reason that the CMA wanted to block the the Microsoft acquisition of ABK was the cloud streaming shit, which was a weird argument in the first place. But if Microsoft bought Ubisoft, would they have to do something else? Would the streaming have to go elsewhere? How would that... I, I don't know. I'm not a fucking legal analyst. But yeah, so it, it's fascinating to me the situation where the stealth sequences people shit on that that was probably that was probably the biggest criticism that i saw online of people being like these stealth sections suck these four stealth sections like the you know get caught and have to restart people seem to really really dislike that and then you pile that on with the fact that ubisoft only gave people like six days the, the review embargo, they had like six days before they had to publish their review if they wanted to meet embargo. And it's like, dude, you're talking about a 30 plus hour game. You're giving these people six days to, to really dive into this and get their review out. And then you also have the stealth sections on top of that where, OK, for me personally, it didn't really it didn't really factor into me like coming away from the game with a, a negative taste in my mouth because it's like. I'm not cramming for a review though, you know, where if I was failing these stealth sections one after another, and I'm trying to get this review out in six days, I would be super fucking bummed. And that would definitely negatively impact my overall opinion of the game. And that's not even to mention the volume, whatever, 1.2 or whatever, that, that somehow had a game breaking bug pop up. And they told the people who bought in early to restart their progress, just so many bad shit crazy situations all surrounding that one game but yeah star wars outlaws man like a dragon gaiden the man who erased his name picked this up um playing through the yakuza series right now obviously i can't talk about this game because i'm still i'm on yakuza 3 so i got quite a long ways to go before i get to like a dragon gaiden but i've heard great things about it and i've also heard really great things about like a dragon Ishin. So I'm going ahead and preparing, getting the physical copies ready for whenever I do in 10 years, 20 years, hopefully before the time I hit the grave, get to the point where I can play like a Dragon Gaiden or like a Dragon Ishin. But heard great things about both games. I think that if I'm not mistaken, Ishin or is it Gaiden, the one that has like a really, really emotional, hard hitting story. But yeah, excited to get around to them. And speaking of Ubisoft, one of the big reasons that their stock is continuously tanking skull and bones the 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 quadruple a title that that really went out and uh dominated this year what a strange strange year for the old live service market skull and bones and suicide squad and concord just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars down the drain and next oh and the reason why I, I didn't even mention the reason i picked up skull and bones it was a part of the um ten dollar for ten day best buy deal thing that they do they do that a couple times a year i think but it was it was on there for 10 bucks it's like yeah fuck it uh, I, if i'm ever gonna buy this thing it'll be in a ten dollar for ten day sort of deal situation and i am kind of 
like morbidly curious just to jump into that game and see what the hell happens. Because I have heard some of the mechanics aren't awful, but I don't really, if I'm being honest, it's more of a, once again, kind of a novelty thing. I just kind of want to have it and, and maybe jump into it at some point to see if there's anything redeeming about that game whatsoever. And then this is not a PlayStation 5 related pickup, but it is worth mentioning. I picked up Piano 3, the Capcom. This is a part of the, what was it, like the, the GameCube 5 or whatever they called it, where Capcom was committed to putting out exclusives for the GameCube. And as you see here, I hope you can see that, uh, $34.99 for this. And it was at my local GameStop. And I know GameStop has been rolling out their retro catalog a little bit more so check around for your your local game stop to see if you got any good deals like that because i was looking online because i remember pno3 being up there in price a couple years ago so when i when i saw 34.99 i was like oh shit am i getting a, a real good deal but it looks like prices just in general have fallen off for <laughs> gamecube games because i also saw beautiful uh, beautiful joe was like 40 bucks and i remember i at least i think i remember that being up there like super expensive a couple years ago. So yeah, man. And it, with Piano 3, 34 dollars was still a, a really damn good price. The, the game is in great condition because when I saw it online, it was still going for like 60, 65 bucks. So still a pretty good deal. So yeah, for any of you retro collectors out there, it might be worth, you know, checking around your your local area, your local game stop, see, seeing if they're shipping out some retro content to that area and seeing if you can get a good deal or two out there. But speaking of damn GameStop, they closed down Game Informer, and this, let's see if I can get it in the camera, this is officially the last copy of the Game Informer magazine that will ever be published, and uh, it's a fucking absolute bummer, man. Um, Game Informer, the well, for the magazine, I've been reading for forever. I just had it with my membership with GameStop for fucking decades, and then whenever they went independent, I went and supported that, and... Uh, the podcast, the Game Informer podcast, was my first video game podcast I ever listened to. Um, uh, really, I, just just a crazy situation. They they were a media giant in the gaming space, and obviously, for those of you who don't know, they were owned by GameStop. And uh, you know, as GameStop was making cuts, Game Informer seemed like a an obvious cut, and they indeed cut Game Informer the entire website was shut down archived content that goes back decades seems to be lost to time and just a batshit crazy situation all around but i am happy to have gotten this this final copy of the magazine it's you know once again talking about novelty items i think that's a cool piece to have in the collection i have fucking hundreds of other game informer magazines just sitting around so i don't know last edition of the game informer magazine fucking crazy 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 uh yeah that's the episode those are my ps5 pickups sorry to end on a on a depressing note there but yeah ps5 pickups a gamecube pickup a game informer magazine and that's about it for me. I also, uh, well, we'll save it for the next Picos video. You'll you'll see it the next Picos video. Kind of directly tying from that to the next thing that we're going to talk about. Whenever we get to the PS5 Picos video in probably a couple months from now. So we'll, we'll, we'll use that as, as a, uh, a little teaser. But I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Appreciate y'all for stopping by. If you enjoy the content, leave a like, a subscribe, a ring the bell notification, drop a comment. All of that shit massively helps out and gets the algorithm kicking this out to new eyeballs. So... Greatly, greatly appreciate you all for uh, taking the time to, to watch this here content. And I shall see you good people very soon. Goodbye.